Hello and welcome to our audience joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, today's program is part of a new AGSIW, relatively new AGSIW uh, product called the China Gulf Initiative, launched earlier this year and led by AGSIW Senior Resident Scholar Robert Mogilnicki, who will be moderating the session today. Uh, I'll share with you the link uh, to the initiative page on the AGS, uh, AGSIW website, uh, which feature past programs and blogs that explore the expanding and multifaceted relations between China and Gulf Arab states, including a blog uh, related to today's topic uh, published by Robert back in July. With that, uh, I'll turn our attention to today's panel and welcome our stellar panel of speakers. Uh, I will introduce them very quickly here and share their full bios as well with you in the chat. Uh, first, I'm happy to welcome back Ben Cahill, Senior Fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program at CSIS. He covers oil markets, geopolitics, and macro trends affecting the oil and gas industry. He also leads a research initiative on meth methane emissions and global gas and uh, analyzes how national oil companies are responding to the energy transition. He was previously a director in the Energy Intelligence's Research and Advisory Group. Uh, I'm also happy to welcome our friend Kate Dorian, non-resident fellow at AGSIW, where her analysis appears regularly. She is a contributing editor at MIS and a fellow at the Energy Institute. Uh, previously, she was the regional manager for the Middle East and Gulf states at the World Energy Council, as well as the program officer for the Middle East and North Africa and the Global Energy Relations Division the International Air Energy Agency. Before that, she was the editor-in-chief the, for the Middle East for oil price reporting agency Platts, now a division of s and Global. Uh, last but not least is Ed Morse, the managing director and global head of commodities research at Citigroup. He previously held similar positions at Lehman Brothers, LCM Commodities, and Credit Suisse. Widely cited in the media is a contributor to publications such as Foreign Affairs, Financial Times, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. Previously, he was advisor to the U.S. Departments of State, Energy and Defense, and to the International Energy Agency on issues related to oil, natural gas, and the impact of financial flow on energy prices. Moderating the session today, as mentioned, is Robert Mogilnicki, Senior Resident Scholar at AGSIW. He created and leads the Next Gen Gulf Series, examining technology trends in the Gulf, and, um, and looking east, uh, the Gulf, uh, China Gulf Initiative. He teaches a graduate level seminar on China, Middle East and North Africa relations as an adjunct assistant professor at Georgetown University's Walsh School of Foreign Service and the George Washington University Elliott School of International Affairs. And with that, Robert, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond. Uh, this crazy period in global energy markets is, is really as good of a time as any to take a deeper look at evolving Chinese demand for Gulf oil and gas. Those watching China's China Middle East relations will know that ties are multifaceted and deep, uh, yet energy is at the core of Chinese engagement uh, with the region, and that's especially the case in the Gulf. Uh, as Raymond noted back in July, I did write a piece on this topic, arguing essentially that China's willingness to boost imports of discounted Russian uh, crude oil reinforces why Gulf oil and gas producing states should strive diversified energy partnerships. And you can find that on our website. But this piece really just scratches the surface of this topic, which is why I'm delighted to have Ed, Kate, and Ben uh, here with me today. I'm going to ask them to give us their take on these energy relationships, considering developments in the Gulf, uh, in China, and also macro trends. But before I do that, it's worth noting that while China is a central market for Saudi, Iraqi, Omani, Emirati, and Kuwaiti crude oil, and also Qatari LNG exports, Chinese influence across the region is not evenly distributed. We see in Saudi Arabia, the country exports more crude oil to China than any other Gulf country. And just in August, Aramco and Sinopec signed a wide ranging MOU covering multiple areas of collaboration. And hopefully we will get into that a little bit later today. Iraq, the next largest supplier in the region, has historically shipped a good deal of crude oil to India as well. And we see uh, China and India um, alternating as the top destination for Iraqi crude oil uh, in recent years. Oman ships a majority, and in some months, almost all of its crude oil exports to China, which potentially creates a worrying dependency on just one energy partnership. 
When we look to Kuwait, the UAE, and Qatar, we tend to see more diversified energy partnerships wherein Chinese customers are certainly important, but they're not the only game in town. And Bahrain's energy trade with China is negligible. And this doesn't even get into Iran-China energy ties. But looking at energy-related trends within China are also, um, it, it's also important, whether we're talking about strategies to shift 80% of the country's energy mix to non-fossil fuel sources by 2060, or continued lockdowns across the country as part of zero COVID policies. And there are also broader forces beyond those brewing in the Gulf and in China that are at play and we will discuss today. So um, I hope that you will pepper us with a lot of really good and please concise questions because we only have an hour uh, to get to all of them. So I'm going to start with Kate uh, to give us a view of what's going on in the Gulf. So Kate, how do Gulf states view their energy relationships with China? And where do you view room for expansion in these energy ties? And where might Gulf suppliers need to diversify their partnerships beyond China? Thinking places, uh, countries like Oman and Iraq, uh, for example. So over to you, Kate. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'm going to start with um, looking at Iraq, for example. I don't know if, if anybody's followed, but ExxonMobil was one of the first big major companies to go into Iraq. They've got a major oil field that they're now trying to exit. And one of the proposals was to sell it to their Chinese partners, CNPC, um, in this big field. Of, yeah. And the Iraqis said, actually, no, because we have too much Chinese influence on in the upstream. It's fine to give projects to Chinese companies for, uh, you know, refining and uh, construction work. And of course, they have this oil for infrastructure deal, which... Uh, which is quite a complex um, mechanism for Chinese investments to, in, into Iraq. But I mean, I think that it just shows that there are certain limits as to how much influence even a country like Iraq would like China to have in, in its upstream. Now, you look at, at Saudi Arabia, obviously, Saudi Arabia, it's not the first time that they have this strategic relationship with, uh, with China. There's Chinese investment. Initially, it started as an energy relationship. Obviously, as you said, a lot of Saudi crude, um, Saudi Arabia, until recently, was the top supplier of crude oil to, um, to China. But of course, now we have Russia with its discounted oil. And I think it's a mistake to see you know, Russian crude displacing Saudi oil in China because the Saudis are now diverting more to Europe. So that's kind of changed the equation a little bit, the sort of the trade balance. But um, the, the Saudi Aramco already had downstream assets uh, earlier this year, and, and there was always talk of expanding that relationship. It sort of came to a slight halt, I think, partly because of, of 2020, you know, demand stump. And then they uh, earlier this year, they announced that they were going to expand their refining capacity in China by 300,000 barrels a day. In August, you had this strategic partnership with, uh, with side between Aramco and Sandepec, which has not yet um, showed. We don't exactly know what it's going, but it's mainly downstream. It's petrochemicals. That's where the growth market is. Um, and I seem to remember, you know, China was not as price sensitive as it is today. I mean, not be, and even before the Chinese economy started to wobble. Um, they started filling their strategic stocks in 2004 when it, there was double digit growth in China. And it does play a very important role in the, the whole demand forecast. I mean, now we see that it's mainly oil prices have come off mainly because of the situation in China, because of uh, the you know, COVID restrictions, which have dampened demand. So it does have a lot of clout. But last November, when OPEC was refusing to take any action, to bring prices down, the Chinese release from, from their strategic stocks, which was also a measure of, of their cloud. But despite the fact that there has been an increase in, in investment, you know, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, the, the sovereign wealth funds in the UAE, Saudi Arabia, putting more in, in, into China, there is a cultural issue. I mean, I was talking to a senior Saudi, and he said, you know what? We don't really understand them. And I think one of the main problems in expanding what, you know, they, they say they want to expand cultural relations with China, et cetera. There is a cultural barrier uh, because, you know, these countries are more, have, have always looked more to the West than they have to, to, uh, to the East. It's changing, but it's going to change very, very slowly. And he said, you know, we just don't really understand them. But 
In the early days when Chinese uh, investments was going into Iraq, for example, I was talking to somebody from one of the major oil companies. They had a joint venture with the Chinese. And I said to him, so how is it going? He said, you know, they do a lot of photocopying, you know, i.e. try to get some of the, the, the Western technology uh, know-how. But that stopped, you know, they've become much more sophisticated. So I think it's um, infrastructure development, that's, that's also expanding. But I don't, but if you look at the military relationship with the West, that's going to trump, um, you know, trade relations with, with China because it's, it's far higher if you look at, you know, US arms deals in, with, with Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, so I think it's, it's a very, it's an evolving relationship. Mm -hmm. um, just let me quickly follow on a point you made about price sensitivity. For September, uh, Aramco prices uh, for Asia were, I, I believe, I mean, in, in some cases, that's uh, at record highs, and then they dropped uh, quite a bit for October. Um, what do you, how do, how are you reading these uh, these price fluctuations in terms of uh, potential sensitivities within China? Um, how, how should we how should we read these? Well, I think it's interesting that even though the, the, the Saudi prices uh, to the European market, Mediterranean market, were much higher than the differential was at record highs, Europe was still buying more, more oil from Saudi than they were, say, from Iraq. But then it was, it was a quality issue. So I think, um, you know, yes, there is more competition to, uh, in, in, into Asia. You know, India, China, India is very price sensitive. But, you know, at one point, China was filling up its strategic reserve when prices were over, you know, were near record highs. But that's no longer the case anymore. So I think that's a recognition, even though Aramco says that it's, you know, pricing strategy has all you do with politics or, you know, it, they, they look at refining margins and net packs and so on. But I think there is now heightened competition. Don't forget, there's also Iran involved. You know, Iran wants to sell. China's been taking more of its oil. You mentioned Oman selling all of its oil. I think part of it is not Omani oil because, you know, it's uh, it's more than they, they export. So some of that Iranian oil is being disguised, you know, as, as Omani oil. So I think it's, um, yeah, there is obviously more and more competition, even if Europe can absorb some, but, you know, it can only absorb so much. Okay, thanks, Kate. Uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to you. Um... On, on more on, on different countries. Thanks for covering Saudi and uh, Oman, Iraq uh, in, in, in some depth there. Let's go to Ed now um, for um, what's going on in China. I mean, in particular, I'd like to get your view, Ed, about developments, initiatives, strategies within China that you view as having the biggest impact, whether it's current or future, on uh, China Gulf energy ties. Sure. So um, China has two different perspectives for Middle East and other exporters, whether you're looking at the short term or the longer term. The short term, of course, involves a recovery from the COVID lockdowns uh, and the economic recovery uh, that would take place, which would give rise in the short run to potentially significant volumes of oil that could be brought. I'll talk about the context in a minute. In the longer run, there is pretty universal agreement that Chinese domestic demand is going to peak. Uh, and it's going to peak in this decade. Uh, some of it will peak early in the decade, uh, some of it uh, later in the decade or beyond that. But in terms of peak use, it could be as early as 2025, 2026. So let me separate out the uh, shorter term from the longer term. Uh, China has been for a long time the fastest growing commodity importing country in the world, including on the oil side. It no longer is and it no longer will be. Uh, and now that it is, in fact, the largest importer of oil uh, and other commodities, when China sneezes, it affects the rest of the world. When there's a change in policy, it affects the world. So let's look at the policy context in China at the moment. There has been a renewed emphasis. Actually, that renewed emphasis has been increased from where it was, and it's already been sharp a year or two ago, on uh, looking at the risks involved related to Taiwan, uh, and that, of course, is exacerbated by Russia, Ukraine. Uh, on that, they have made a clear decision to reduce to the degree possible their reliance on seaborne imports and wherever possible to either replace them with domestic production, as is now being done with the goal of 10% per annum production growth in natural gas, or by their growth in uh, going back to increasing their thermal coal 
output at home by uh, one third in order to stop their increased reliance on natural gas imports, whether from uh, Qatar or the US uh, or Australia. So limiting volumes is another issue. They have a very strict uh, issue that's the parallel of what Kate spoke about with respect to Iraqi exports. China has always been reluctant to be overly dependent on a single supplier. They've had a rule basically of not more than 20% of anything comes from one supplier. Uh, in the case of oil, in practice, it's not been more than 15%. Uh, so 10 million barrels a day of imports, a million and a half barrels a day rounded of uh, maximum production from Saudi Arabia. Russia seems to be a little bit uh, of, a, uh, of, 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 of an exception on that part. But the, the two things are limiting volume uh, and limiting seaborne uh, imports. Um, and they've also recently impacted the entire market, also affecting uh, Middle East and other uh, refinery margins by deciding last September, a year ago, to stop uh, exporting product, which has been about a million barrels a day, 600,000 of which has been diesel, up to 700,000 depending on the season. And that has a significant role to play in the diesel markets today if they should release uh, more licenses, since they seem to be planning now, it could also have a radical impact on uh, diesel exports from the rest of the world, including the Middle East that have been replacing those Chinese uh, exports. On the domestic side, they're also looking at stability, which has impacted uh, things that we've seen in the past. And they started to look at um, this in the context of uh, the price run up in 2008 um, and the aftermath of that where uh, they put price controls on at home so that uh, refinery margins would be guaranteed at a certain level uh, and uh, they would uh, limit imports whenever there was a price spike uh, and increase. Uh, and yes, Kate mentioned uh, the short-term policy of a, a bit ago of buying at a high price. That bid ago was March and April, triggered, I think, by political issues. But basically, they want to buy low and sell high. They coordinated a strategic petroleum release with the United States. Uh, the US White House is now talking in the same language as China of, of starting to buy back the SPR oil that's now at it, running at a million barrels a day of exports uh, if prices go below $80 a barrel. It's, an, it's a very specific adaptation of the two. So in the short run, I think we're going to see a significant jump in Chinese um, imports, depending on policy in the lockdown. Uh, we're going to see the lockdown staying, we're sure, through the near-term party Congress. We'll know what President Xi's future is, and everybody expects there to be a loosening of the lockdown. And then the question is, uh, as noted earlier, will, will, what the policies are that are going to uh, result from that. Will it be mostly an infrastructure build? Uh, done through state-owned companies? Uh, will it be anything related to giving a boost to the property sector, which has been a significant element of their demand growth? If they want to get back, as they've announced, a 6.5% growth next year, they will have to do something in the property market in order to achieve that and in order to stimulate uh, the kinds of imports that would be coming. Uh, so we expect um, there to be uh, you know, kind of significant near-term uh, impact. We're looking in uh, uh, in uh, crude oil imports, uh, which have dropped uh, this year to date to average uh, around uh, 13.8 million barrels a day, down from 14.3-ish in 2021. Um, we think they could rise as much as a million barrels a day uh, with recovery. I don't think it will be the full million, but it could be the full million. Uh, certainly the refinery throughput would be that, and they have stockpiled uh, a lot at home. But that, that's a kind of 6.8% increase in uh, where demand for crude will be, uh, very significant, and how it's divided up between the domestic uh, markets and the international remark markets remains uh, really to be seen. The big picture on China is, however, what's happening to overall demand in the domestic market. This was a country that was running double-digit GDP growth and at the same time double-digit demand growth for oil. That came to 
an absolutely sudden stop in 2010, 2011, coinciding with the drop, the ending of an urbanization, forced urbanization, massive urbanization, creating 10 cities a year at least of a million people or more in that entire period of 1990 to 2010. They stopped doing it then. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, gas oil demand growth came to an end. And on, on the gas oil side, uh, the numbers are pretty stark. Gas oil demand actually peaked uh, more than uh, seven years ago at 3.5 million barrels a day. We saw uh, growth of gas oil demand uh, with the recovery from the pandemic and the lows of the pandemic, uh, but uh, we still expect gas oil demand, which was still down in 2021, by 1% below 2020, even with that recovery. Uh, in 2020, it went down uh, minus 2.6%. 2018, before that, it was minus 6%. They're not using diesel the way they did when they were building 10 cities of a million people or more. And uh, what we're seeing on the horizon is a peaking of transportation fuel demand, both diesel and gasoline, as closely to now as 2025. Uh, the big growth, which certainly has impacted, uh, as Kate knows better than most of us, or you do, uh, the uh, degree to which Middle East exporters, Saudi Arabia in particular, have looked to JVs on a petrochemical side and refining petrochemical side and direct conversion of crude oil to pet chems. We expect a significant growth of naphtha and LPG demand, and the new uh, co-venture refineries are really made to have a high yield of pet chem feedstock. Um, that'll continue through 2030, 2040 before peaking, but overall demand, we think, will peak uh, before 2030, whether it's 25, 26, or 27 uh, remains an open question. So the big expansion of uh, demand that was so useful for the Middle East exporters really is, is going to be coming to an end. So that's the overview and summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. You gave us a lot to, a lot to chew on there, and all of the, the data statistics are, are very helpful. Um, let me now move over to, to Ben. Um, what are the macro trends? I mean, tr trying to zoom out a little bit more, what are the macro trends um, and also various dimensions of the global energy transition that you believe to um, be the most uh, consequential in how they may affect China Gulf energy relations. Well, thanks, Robert. It's great to be with you and great to be on the panel with, with Kate and with Ed today. Um, maybe I'll just start with a couple of broad points about the Russia-Ukraine war and how this is reshaping global oil flows. And just to add a couple of points, if I can, about the role of Chinese investment in other parts of this bilateral energy relationship between the Gulf states and, and China. So the most disruptive force in the global oil market today is Russia, Ukraine. Uh, we're seeing a reshaping of global oil flows. Of course, we are in the midst of all this debate, discussion about what will happen with the oil price cap idea. But as of right now, Europe is moving very quickly to displace Russian oil. There's an EU partial embargo and the shipping and services insurance ban, which is supposed to come into effect on December 5th for crude oil and next February for products. Um, and so this is affecting every oil producer around the world and oil flows in a big way. Um, I think a lot of people expected that with this need of Russia to redirect a lot of its oil eastward to Asia and especially to China, that China would benefit from this, that China would get a lot of leverage out of this relationship. And I do think that's true, but I also think it's a bit overstated. I think from the Chinese government perspective, there are clearly some risks in trying to grow the energy relationship with Russia. Uh, Russia is going to be a declining producer. Uh, it's losing partners. It's losing technical capacity. It's losing service sector companies, losing investment capital. So over the medium term, I mean, clearly there are a lot of risks associated with you know, the Russian production outlook. And obviously the Chinese are quite aware of this. So the notion that they're suddenly going to, you know, consume all available Russian crude and products and, and natural gas and LNG exports, I think is a little bit overstated. Um, to me, it's important to keep in mind, you know, this is a relationship with a long history. We won't get into the politics of the Russia-China bilateral relationship, but obviously that's complicated. But in energy terms, it's not always been the, the smoothest relationship. When you think about the power of Siberia, 
gas pipeline and the extremely long, difficult negotiations over prices that happened between the two sides. So, you know, switching volumes and, and, and having China suck it all up is it's a bit of a complicated proposition. But it does raise an interesting question to me. You know, in the coming years, we are going to have a world where potentially Russia is going to compete a lot more directly with the Gulf states for market share in China. And that poses some interesting questions, I think, for OPEC plus cooperation, some potential friction within the group as Russia and, and the Gulf states are really looking to China as a key export market and trying to secure a larger foothold there. Um, more Gulf crude is going to flow to Europe. I mean, the data shows us that this is already happening. So this rebalancing of crude flows will mean that Russia you know, takes a bigger share of Chinese demand. Um, just to put some numbers on it, you know, in the last year or two, Russia exported about 1.5 to 1.6 million barrels of, of oil to China. Um, about half of that was by pipeline, uh, the ESPO pipeline, and half of it was by seaborne volumes. So the growth would come through seaborne imports. As Ed mentioned, and I think this is an important point, Chinese government is pretty protective of, um, you know, it's very conscious of security risks and security of supply risks. Taking too many seaborne volumes from one seller, especially a distressed seller, is something that they probably want to avoid. But to me, the official sales prices that Saudi Aramco uses for different regions month by month kind of shows this, you know, a near-term snapshot of you know, the regional rebalancing and how they're thinking about the strength of different markets. Um, let me just make a couple of broader points about the, the broader energy relationship between the Gulf states and China. So as I'd mentioned, you know, market share in China is a huge issue. The Chinese have had this policy of not more than 20% for any supplier. They would like it to be not more than 15%. Uh, at various times, Russia and Saudi Arabia have both surpassed this level, but it is a really key driver for China, and it means that there's fierce competition for market share within China, and we've seen that over the years. I think Saudi Aramco and the other Gulf NOCs are really obsessed with monitoring Chinese market demand and understanding at a micro level what market movements will do. China and India are really the two critical export markets for Aramco, for example. You know, the U.S. is really important from a policy perspective because of its role in reshaping global dynamics through you know, policy and sanctions, et cetera. But China and India have been the growth stories. And it's interesting to hear Ed lay out a case for diminished growth in the future. I think that's pretty significant. So obviously they see China as an essential export market, but in terms of an energy investor into their, their own sectors, I still think there's quite a bit of caution and a bit of reserve about you know, inviting a bigger role for the Chinese oil companies. And you see this right across the region, whether it's Qatar or Abu Dhabi or Saudi Arabia. Just to give you a couple of examples, um, in Abu Dhabi, you know, you've seen a huge number of companies gain a foothold there as new concessions were signed in recent years, both onshore and offshore. And it's true that the Chinese companies have gained a bigger foothold in offshore concessions, but so have Indian and Korean companies. You know, you look at the changes in the upstream landscape in Abu Dhabi, there's not really a bigger uh, presence of the Chinese NOCs compared with the others. And I think there's still some wariness, of, wariness about technical capacity there. There was an oil pipeline that was built years back, the Habshan Fujaira pipeline, built by a subsidiary of CNPC, I believe. Uh, in Abu Dhabi, they were a little bit unhappy with how that project turned out. It was behind schedule. There were some technical disagreements. It was a bit of a distrust. Clearly, ADNOC is more comfortable with the Western majors from a technical capacity than the Chinese companies. Um, they're more used to them, they have more familiarity with them. There's definitely a rebalancing of you know, technical and commercial offer with the geopolitics. So it has changed. There's a much bigger presence for Asian companies in the upstream there, a bit, a bit of caution. And I think the same is definitely true in Qatar. Right now, Qatar is in the midst of you know, uh, awarding new equity stakes in the LNG expansion for those four new trains with two more to follow. And so far, the Western majors are the winners of the big stakes. So there will be space for smaller equity stakes for the Chinese NOCs, <clears throat> excuse me, potentially the Indian and Koreans as well. But it's striking that they have not really been awarded, you know, those big, those big stakes. Um, and historically, China really hasn't been a critical partner for LNG. Um, the Japanese and Korean companies were kind of the original off-takers of cutlery LNG. China came later. They have more familiarity with those other companies and longer standing relationships. And the last point I'll make is I think the same is true in Saudi Arabia. If you look at the petrochemical sector in Saudi, you know, the key partners are really the Western majors and the, even the Japanese companies, not so much the Chinese. But it is really critical for them, and this gets to the question about energy transition, to make those investments in China in the refining and especially the petrochemical sector for the reasons that Ed laid out. I would just 
make a final note here. That's been a difficult slog for Aramco. Hasn't always been successful. These projects that take a ton of time to negotiate. It's been a difficult process to get in. They're politically sensitive. The rewards haven't always been there. So yes, they see it as a critical source of market demand. They want to lock up demand for their crude. They want to have a presence closer to the markets and the customers there. But it's been a bit of a rough ride. Thanks, Ben. Let me ask you a follow-on question there, because you you ended talking about uh, Aramco and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, what what do you make of this MOU from August? It was a big media splash. The Aramco Sinopec uh, MOU described um, as a quote, you know, new chapter in the energy relationship. Is this a new chapter? Does it um, attempt to bridge some of those issues that distrust that you talked about? Um, and, and what should we be focusing on? I know from my other areas of research, when I look at Chinese MOUs specifically related to the BRI, I tend to discard them right away and wait for actual news of, of, uh, of investment. So um, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on it and also um, bring Kate in too, if she would have, if she wants to, to add on the, onto that point. Yeah, briefly, I would say it's not about a relationship of distrust. Um, and I do think that those downstream investments in China are seen as really strategically important for Aramco. And that's been the case for a long time. Part of this is about the nature of long-term oil demand. You know, I think there's an expectation that petrochemicals are going to make up a bigger chunk of oil demand. A lot of that demand is going to be in Asia. It's important to get a foothold in those markets directly close to the customer, especially with partners you know, who have a real presence um, in that market. And these joint ventures with the Chinese MSCs have been a critical way of doing it. So I see that as kind of a continuation, it's just that it hasn't always been an easy process for Remco or the other Gulf MSCs. Thanks. Kate, do you have anything you want to weigh in on on that point? Yeah, you were saying, you know, about these MOUs that are signed. I mean, look at Iran, which is supposed to get so much Chinese investment and how much of that has actually been realized. Not very much. And even the Iranians, you know, who um, were under sanctions or Western companies pulled out, they didn't particularly want the Chinese in. The Chinese were in and, you know, and their the oil field developments that they were supposed to be developing didn't really go very far. So they would much rather have the Western technology. But um, I think on the renewable energy side, there is more scope for for um, cooperation with China. You know, on solar energy, on hyd- the, the hydrogen, and I think that's where we're heading um, in in that direction. If you look at the sort of these agreement signed with, between Aramco and and, um, and Sunpec. I think that's where there will be more investment. There will be more, um, you know, sort of joint ventures that we will see. But um, as, you know, as everybody mentioned, it's not so much the, the, the upstream Saudi Arabia is closed anyway. The Chinese went in when they opened up the gas um, and they, you know, and then they left because uh, the, the they didn't find enough that was commercially viable and the, the you know negotiations with the Ramco on, on offtake prices with the investors were didn't go anywhere so that was abandoned but i think that's where you're going to see more um, more investment but you know that the interesting thing and and, and i want to uh, mention something here is where the iraq oil report had an interview with the former iraqi um, finance minister who's now um, resigned ali alawi and he said you know the Chinese investments don't come without cost. And, and he said, you know, the Chinese loans have been on the upper range of what is acceptable financially. So he says they're more expensive than the EU, the UK or Japanese loans. So that even if the cost of whatever they build, if you give them, you know, a, a refinery or a, or a power station, um, they, might, they might do it 20% lower than any other um, contractor but it's going to be funded the cost of funds is actually higher which is i think interesting as well because you know we talk a lot about the belt and road initiative and the debt trap so now the chinese have sort of realized that there, there is an issue with the, the, the accumulated debts particularly in 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 developing countries in africa for example so some of that debt and i think that must be an issue if you look at the economic situation in china at the moment i mean one wonders how much they can actually afford to continue with this sort of checkbook diplomacy because it's not, there's no military influence um, for for China. What I think is attractive for the Gulf states is that it's, um, there is no judgment. It's non-committal. It's not, uh, you know, there is, there are no human rights issues that come into play, uh, you know, uh, and and at the same time, we are seeing a sort of, 
the Biden administration saying, OK, you know, we will release those military, um, uh, you know, the, the, the aid that was withheld and the military supplies that were withheld to the UAE and, and Saudi are now flowing again. So I think we are seeing competition, but it's not equal competition between, say, the West and, and China. It's a totally different relationship. Those are those are really good points, Kate. I mean, it's it's clear that certain elements of, of the BRI uh, certainly are uh, slowing down or decelerating, um, and the Chinese are in many cases less willing to um, to forgive loans than other partners. So, and those are important um, pieces of the puzzle. One of the questions brings us back to um, to the role of of Russia in in this discussion. So, I I wanted to pick up on perhaps or or pose a question that Ben presented to the group and or, or brought up in his comments and present it to, um, to Ed and to Kate. Do you see a world ahead of us where Russia is increasingly competing uh, with um, Gulf producers and suppliers? And if so, what are the implications uh, of, of such a world for um, China Gulf energy ties? So maybe we'll start with, with you, Ed. Well, I think it's important to go back and note the differences that arose between Russia and the kingdom um, in the winter of 2019-2020. You know, basically, uh, the Russians had felt that uh, they had gotten uh, the lesser end of the bargain in the relationship between the two. And market share was very explicit in public statements that were made at the time by the CEO of Rosneft, the largest producer, uh, saying that very publicly, in uh, more so in January of 2020 than December of 2019, uh, for a number of political reasons, that uh, market share losses were critical and that Russia needed to strike out on its own, uh, particularly given how low uh, costs of finding and developing oil were in Russia. Russia was, at that point, uh, benefiting from the tight ties they had with Western companies, the tight ties not only on the production side, but in LNG uh, and also uh, with respect to state-of-the-art technology. So uh, the world has changed significantly from them from then, but there was a sense of rivalry uh, after, uh, you know, the first phase of of the recovery and pre-pandemic was over. And, there's every good reason to expect that if things turn to normal, that would be uh, the, the road to be pursued. But on the other hand, the, the world is not going to be returning to normal uh, in all likelihood. There are really new and significant uh, elements uh, that have arisen geopolitically. One of them is something that uh, the market has not grasped quite uh, as well yet as some uh, geopolitical observers have, and that is uh, what has all of this done to those countries that have relied on Russia for their security? Uh, And we're seeing this with respect to Turkey. We're seeing it with respect to uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan. Uh, We're seeing it with respect to Kazakhstan, Russia. Uh, So there there is definitely a uh, reduction in the soft power, let alone the hard power uh, of Moscow uh, regionally and globally. Uh, which also has to be taken into account. Kate? Yeah, no, I was going to say, you know, one thing that, um, that, that we haven't really discussed is the fact that most of the Gulf states, nearly all of them, uh, have their currencies pegged to the US dollar, except for Kuwait. So I think that makes it, um, you know, it makes it really difficult when you hear talk of, yes, um, you know, maybe Egypt is thinking of, of, of um, uh, trading with China and Renminbi for their imports, it doesn't really happen because, you know, it's uh, particularly when you look at their, their foreign debts, um, uh, you know, their debt servicing is, is very high in Egypt. But um, it's, uh, I think that's one, you know, one very, very important part of the relationship with, with the West. But, you know, Russia, if you look at the relationship between the Gulf states and, and, and Russia, I mean, if you look at the OPEC meetings, the OPEC plus meetings in the recent days, Russia has been kind of silent. You know, they've just gone along with everything that Saudi says. And I think Alexander Novak, the deputy prime minister, said it. He said, whatever my brother the Saudi oil minister, um, His Highness Prince Abdelaziz, says is OK with me. So they put aside that, you know, very damaging 
battle for market share, which is what really sent prices tumbling in 2020. And they seem to have set that aside. But at the same time, all the investments that they were talking about, that the, the Saudi Arabia was going to invest in energy projects, they were looking at this, that, and the other, it didn't really materialize. And I think that's, um, you know, the the China Russia relationship, I think, is is uh, you know obviously strategically important. But I don't think that Xi is going to put all his eggs in in one basket. You know, despite all the the optics of the summer come summit and you know traveling to uh, to to Central Asia for this for this you know grand meeting. Uh, I mean, we wait and see what happens. Iran is obviously being invited in, and and but. You know, it's but it is that the geopolitics is changing. You know, it is a, a new platform whereby some of these countries that are that have issues with the West have created this sort of platform through the Shanghai Cooperation um, Organization to show that they, you know, they are counterbalancing. But, but you know, in reality, they're not. Thanks, Kate. I'm going to get back to your point on uh, prospects for denting dollar dominance in, in just a minute, but I think it's only fair because Ben. Uh, pose the question to give him the last chance to to add any points uh, and round out the discussion on on Russian competition um, with uh, with the Gulf. So Ben, um, any points you'd want to add? Um, I mean, right now Russia needs allies, and in the very short term, there's definitely an alignment of interest between Russia and the OPEC plus states, and we've seen them reiterate over and over again the importance of Russia as a partner within OPEC plus. The fact that they think the Declaration of Cooperation or the whole OPEC Plus framework has been a success since 2017. Um, and that's fine. I think that will continue for some time. Um, it's going to be a period of great volatility in the oil markets, big uncertainty about what happens with Russian flows. So I expect that cooperation will continue. But if you look out over the horizon a little bit, you know, the global oil market is changing. I mean, Europe is essentially going to be cut off to Russian supplies. North America, because of the shale revolution, has become a little bit more of a closed system. Um, the historic role of Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Gulf states and supplying to the U.S. market has definitely diminished. It's not gone, but it's much smaller than it was before. And that means that they're competing over growth areas largely in Asia and in you know, non-OECD countries. <clears throat> and it's a particular challenge for Russia because given the nature of its infrastructure, it's hard for them to find better alternatives uh, than the Chinese market. So. It's not an issue right now, but maybe over the medium term, it will become an area of more friction. And I think it's tied to this, this broader picture of Russia as you know, potentially a really diminishing power on the global stage. It's been quite opportunistic in the broader Middle East, in countries like Syria and elsewhere in recent years. And in some cases, the Russian security presence and investment has been welcomed. I think things will change in the years to come. Thanks, Ben. Um, over to you, Ed. I mean, I want to pick up on the on prospects for denting uh, the dollar's dominance in, in oil markets. Uh, today is the first meeting of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, um, and there have you know, been renewed reports now about uh, various efforts to you know, dent the dollar's dominance. Uh, back in March, we saw some reports about Saudi Arabia considering uh, pricing some of its oil sales to China and Juan. Um, these, these talking points pop up now and again. Um, Kate alluded to, uh, to to this in her in her comments, but what do you make of this? I mean, should how do you measure the prospects for an actual uh, denting of, of uh, dollars dominance? Well, I think the prospects in the near term are fairly slim, uh, very difficult to do, uh, and, and, in, and indeed the Russia Ukraine conflict has made it even more difficult than it was before. And let me let me give you some examples. The role of the United States in the global oil and gas system is revolutionarily changed. At the beginning of this year, the U.S. was a 7 million barrel a day gross exporter of combined crude oil and petroleum products. It was second in the world as a, a, a gross exporter to Russia, not to Saudi Arabia, given uh, where cuts had been and what was happening. Through much of the summer, the U.S. was exporting somewhere between 9 and 11.2 million barrels a day somewhere between not the 2 million barrels a day of crude we were exporting in January and February, but up to 5 million barrels a day with an average of slightly under 4 million a day. And when we get to natural gas, the U.S., once the Freeport 
uh, LNG facility is back and running, will resume its role as the largest LNG exporting country in the world. The U.S. is the largest trading center for oil and gas in the world, and it's going to grow in importance, not diminish in importance. And as that, it has an advantage that a pure exporter or pure importer does not have because all of the trade with the U.S., which is in fact global, will be U.S. dollar denominated. So just from a global positioning um, in this particular market, and oil is by far, along with gas, the biggest chunk of liquidity, as it were, in these markets, it's very hard to dethrone. It, that doesn't mean that there can't be specific relationships that grow. China itself has shown through the uh, BRI that it really does not want the renminbi to become an international currency. There are limits to what it will do. It exposes them to things that they don't want to have happen. Um, and that's why they feel so strongly about a difference between the value of the one in China and outside of China. Uh, so uh, there is a limit on that side. And then you say, who else? Well, Europe is a much more limited importer. Uh, its import position allows the euro to be a significant currency when it comes to international trade in energy. But uh, uh, the countries that are tied to the US dollar are really stuck with it, whether they like it or not. Uh, and the costs of moving away from it are really you know, quite strong at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at uh, at risk of trying to bite off uh, more than we can chew in the remaining uh, minutes we have, I, I would like to open a big can of worms that is Iran and talk a little bit about how Iran ongoing negotiations uh, feature into uh, China Gulf energy relations. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, with Ben here and ask you know how you see Iran featuring into this set of relationships, both as a, you know, as an energy partner for China, but also um, as, as, as a player in you know, creating some degree of friction in the broader region and the geopolitical, uh, geopolitical system. So over to you, Ben. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I'll just start with the obvious, which is that China continues to import a lot of Iranian oil. Um, it's not always labeled as Iranian. If you look at Malaysian exports, it's Malaysian exports have seen an incredible revival in the last year. Somehow they export more than they produce. Um, a lot of this is Iranian oil, obviously blended and, and you know changing hands through ship to ship transfers. And I think it's part of the broader picture, which is that Chinese buying is opportunistic. Um, and if they find a crude available on the market that you know fits their refinery configurations and is available at a good price, they'll buy it. Um, if there is a deal. And if Iranian volumes bounce back, I think the expectation is that China is going to become, you know, a critical import market. Um, there is a comfort level there. I think between the commercial parties, they've done a lot of business with each other in the past. Refineries are used to running this stuff. So I expect that will pick up. Um, you know, in terms of the broader issue around how China is thinking about the importance of an Iranian deal, whether or not energy is the most significant factor, if there are other geopolitical issues at play, I think I would defer to Kate on that. But in pure energy terms, I think, you know, the Chinese would probably welcome the optionality and they'd be willing to accommodate those volumes if they come. Kate? Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, if you look at the import figures from China, um, Russia took Saudi Arabia for sort of four straight months. Um, whether this will continue or not is, is another story because it was mainly the private refiners in, uh, in China that were sort of buying Russian oil, I think now it's expanded. But what I think, you know, to go back to that whole Sinopec Aramco agreement, I think Aramco, you know, let's not forget that Aramco also has storage in 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 Asia, in China, and they can sort of serve um, the the region a lot quicker. Uh, obviously, it's faster to to ship crude to um, to Europe. Um, so having you know having a, a presence in 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 China, Japan, uh, the UAE does as well having storage in these countries and refining capacity and expanding that refining capacity serves the region well. But um, even at the height, you know, we talk about China and LNG, yes, LNG imports are down at the moment, but even at the height of the trade wars, you know, when Trump was uh, was still a president, LNG exports were not included and China was importing a lot of US LNG at one point. 
um, last year. So that's changed now, obviously. But it's it's an interesting dynamic that at the end of the day, the, the energy relationships are so complex that you can't just sort of, you know, you can't pigeonhole them into sort of... It, they're no longer regional. It used to be, you know, gas was very regional, but it's no longer that. Kate, I just want to pick a brain too here because we spent a lot of time today talking about Saudi Arabia, Iraq, even Oman. Um, the UAE is a country you know very well, um, Ben, I believe uh, as well. And I, I wonder if you could just elaborate a little bit on the UAE's relationship with um, w- with China, some of the important, um, you know, the most important points uh, and dimensions of that relationship, and what we what we can maybe expect in um, you know in, in in the coming months and years ahead. Yeah, that's relatively new as well, except for if you look at it, I think at one point the Dragon Market, which is a Chinese sort of shopping mall in in, in Dubai, was one of the biggest retail markets outside of mainland China. I mean, it's huge. It's enormous. You know, when it was first built, we used to take the kids, you know, and they would go running up and down because it was just so huge and cavernous. Uh, but it, the, 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 I think the relationships become more strategic. I think, um, you know, Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed has actually spoken about wanting to sort of expand the relationship, but they see it as a cornerstone cornerstone of their foreign policy. If you look at Chinese investment, say, for example, strategically in Jebel Ali, um, you know, that's that I think is quite important. You know, Jebel Ali is a, is a, is a major transshipment port. It's also a place where the U.S. Navy stops to refuel, jet fuel um, for, its, for its aircraft. But again, you know, you have U.S. bases in, in Abu Dhabi. You've got them in Qatar. You've got them in, you know, across it. So it's... Um, you know, it's an interesting dynamic, but I don't think that China is going to displace the sort of Western um, influence and investment in c- certain sectors. Uh, maybe with with telecoms, yes, with um, you know telecommunications, that's one of the areas that I think is is expanding. But um, other than that, I think it's uh, it, there will be a balance between the two. I think the Gulf states are not going to put all their eggs in the Chinese basket. And I'm sure they're watching the, the economic uh, situation in China. You know, growth forecasts have been uh, been uh, have been revised down for Chinese uh, growth. That obviously impacts. So I, I think it's um, it, I think they will continue to diversify, uh, you know, their their investment portfolios. Ben, how do you view China's role in, in, in the UAE's energy sector? I think it's changing a lot. It started from a pretty low base until recently. Um, the old system in Abu Dhabi was basically you had three major concessions, the onshore concession, ADCO, ADMA APCO, which is a big offshore concession, and ZADCO. And you basically had the Abu Dhabi club of Western super majors. And then Japanese companies had actually quite a big footprint through smaller concessions. And that has changed. The onshore concession was renewed, brought in new partners, including two Chinese companies. Uh, and then when Adma Opco was broken up and separate concessions were signed, Chinese companies won stakes there as well. But as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to note that these are pretty minor stakes. There still isn't the trust level to kind of hand over the biggest uh, assets to Chinese companies or really Asian companies in general. We have to keep in mind, these are the crown jewels of the energy system in Abu Dhabi. I mean, it is a huge cornerstone of the economy. They're much more comfortable having companies like Total and Shell uh, with smaller stakes. But those smaller stakes reflect geopolitical ambitions to increase energy ties, uh, a desire to solidify the market linkages and the export linkages, a way to build relationships with the key importers. So it was very strategically important to bring in more Korean companies and more Chinese companies. And I think that 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 kind of shows the evolving nature of the relationship. Okay, Sven. Now, I will just double back to, to Ed on the Iran front because I didn't get to hear from, from you about your thoughts here. I am curious about how you're factoring in uh, Iran, uh, Iranian supplies, uh, ongoing negotiations into your assessment, your calculations um, for, for energy markets, particular oil markets. Sure. So we, like others, you know, follow the rumor mill as closely as we possibly can uh, and try to figure out, um, you know, who is saying what to whom, for what reason. Uh, but at the moment, it appears as though the obstacles are all domestic and internal in Iran. Um, uh, it was very clear what the limits of the U.S. Uh, position were. People went into that negotiation 
uh, with some optimism that there would be an agreement. Um, and Iran has, for whatever reason, found it difficult to get where it wants to be. And as I said, I think it's mostly a domestic set of issues. Meanwhile, there is more leakage, and some of it is with a wink from uh, the U.S. government. I think one of the most interesting developments in the oil market has been uh, really the increased uh, sale of Iranian condensate into Venezuela, which facilitated uh, growth of Venezuelan production from around a half a million barrels a day to some 900,000 barrels a day at the end of 2021. It stalled out. Uh, there are more Iranian tankers going into, um, going into uh, Venezuela. The global aspect of it is really quite intriguing in that uh, Europe and Russia, Ukraine have a role to play. There's a desire to get more uh, Venezuelan crude from companies that had invested in Venezuela, including European refiners like Repsol and um, uh, and ENI that are now able to offtake more. It's a question of how much uh, more in the way of waivers will be given, how those negotiations go, but certainly we can see the potential for um, Venezuelan production to rise from seven or 800,000 barrels a day to a million and a half uh, by the end or middle of next year, or even higher. The physical capacity probably would be capable of going to 1.7 or 8 without talking about real capital spending of the $10 billion range or higher. This is you know, doing Band-Aids, fixing pipelines, fixing port facilities, and uh, getting the dilution there necessary to have heavy oil flow. So it's, a, it's an intriguing aspect of, of Iran and signals given to Iran of what might happen uh, if they were to rejoin the JCPOA. Okay, thanks. We're really we're we're coming down just to the last few minutes, so I'm going to resist the temptation to uh, to launch into uh, into another big topic. But I just want to give the chance uh, to to anyone, uh, Kate, Ben, um, Ed, final comments here. I mean, this is a broad topic. We uh, inevitably had to whittle down um, various dimensions we could have looked at to some of the key points, uh, some key factors. I think. All of you did a really great job um, identifying where we need to look and, and giving us some of the figures and the data that uh, are helpful for understanding this relationship. Um, before before we wrap things up, I'll just um, yeah give you a chance for any final comments or, or any points that uh, that we didn't have a chance to get to in in our remarks. Anything. Did we do the topic justice? <laughs> no, no, I was going to say, but, no, um, Ed mentioned Venezuela. And of course, you know, there was this alliance between Venezuela and Iran and, you know, swap deals and, you know, because the Venezuelans need to, um, to blend their very heavy crude. But one of the statistics and, uh, you know, I was, I was looking at, at the me story about the latest uh, Chinese imports, which are actually low, but they have fallen. Some of these Malaysian supplies into uh, into China uh, in August were actually, you know, probably Venezuelan, but it doesn't really make that, that much difference. It just shows that China's ready to basically take, um, you know, take discounted oil and keep its friends happy. Obviously, China and Venezuela also have a, uh, a sort of an alliance. Um, so China's been a lifeline to all these countries that are under sanctions. You know, it's provided a lifeline to Iran during sanctions by buying a lot of Iranian oil, Russia, uh, Venezuela. So uh, it yeah. just sort of sets it apart because it is, you know, uh, it has the clout um, to withstand U.S. pressure, I suppose. Well, th yeah, thanks for, I'm glad you had a chance to add that in. And sorry again for uh, the disruption, <laughs> right, in your uh, trying to wrap up your comments. So I'll um, I'll bring things to a close now and just say that uh, our conversation today took a look, an in-depth look at a very important um, area of, of uh, global energy markets, in particular, taking a deep dive into uh, the energy relationship between China and the Gulf. Um, this is an area that's you know, evolving, as I believe Kate um, said in her remarks, and I also use in the title of, of my piece on this topic. Um, we took a look at what's going on within the Gulf uh, dynamics in China and also macro level uh, trends here, but there's a lot more to discuss. 
Um, we're going to be following closely the uh, ongoing negotiations with Iran and a range of other issues, including uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and that and the consequent impacts on energy markets. So uh, do stay tuned. Thanks for the uh, the brave few who, who bared through our disruption um, with uh, upcoming events and also publications on our website. Thanks uh, and a big thanks to for uh, for the part uh, the panelists. Kate and Ben and uh, Ed, and uh, we will see all of you again at an event soon. Take care.